I do with the microphone. Okay, I'll try not to sing. You wouldn't want me to sing, that's for sure. I'm going to take a more, I guess, a more um, uh, generic view, uh, partly because the software that I've been working on for it, since 2005, it's, it's 10 years exactly, <laughs> um, uh, is much more generic than what we've seen uh, in the previous talk. Um, <clears throat> but I want to just comment um, something that came to me this morning as I was tidying up the talk. Um, that I opened the I opened the presentation and it for some reason decided to open an open office rather than PowerPoint, and it reminded me just how unfortunately bad open office is. Now some people may disagree with me about this, but I just find that PowerPoint. I, I use I've used open office PowerPoint, uh, Calc and um, and and uh, the Word equivalent uh, writer. Um, and they're just, they're just not as slick as, 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 the, as, uh, as Microsoft Office. Now, I'm not an apologist for Microsoft Office in any way, but I think what that reflects to me is back-end uh, applications uh, such as Linux, Apache, the sort of stuff we use all the time for servers, it's fine, they're a little bit creaky, for the user because the people who use them are going to basically work their way around it and, you know, kind of give them a challenge. Um, uh, Front-end systems, which the end user are going to use, really have to be very polished. Um, and that means that really one or two people have to be in charge of how the, the front-end is, is developed. And, and uh, really people who, uh, and I make an apology here for myself, are people who really know about design and uh, user interaction and so forth. So it's really, really important, I think, for end-user products that they are very smooth. Now, that doesn't mean they can't be open source, and I mean, I think what we've seen just now is a wonderful example where a smallish group is developing a, an open source uh, solution to the specific needs. Now, some of you may have come to the talk yesterday where I talked about the, the, um, the continuum from bespoke systems at one end through specific systems in the middle, which is what we've just seen, to generic systems at the other end, which is what I'm going to talk about. <coughs> um, so, ten years on, uh, actually I've been doing some open source stuff since the 1990s, and uh, really when, when I first started to do open source, I had some resistance to it. Um, so, uh, when I did Virtual Sydney and Time Map, we were showing 2000, I couldn't persuade them. Virtual Sydney was a museum exhibit uh, which was running on a computer stuck in a cupboard behind the uh, very fancy $20,000 exhibit thing with two 19-inch <laughs> monitors which cost $7,000 each. Um, so you had a map, basically you could navigate them there on the map on the left side and see resources on the right side, and it was a time map and so forth. They wouldn't let us connect that computer to the, to the web because of security reasons, so we couldn't actually get the monitoring. We wanted to monitor the use of the software, and we couldn't. I had to crawl into the cupboard and uh, put a floppy disk in to get the information, pre-USB. Um, uh, uh, they wouldn't let us have a web version because people might not come to the museum. Uh, we, we had lots of arguments about that, but couldn't convince them. They have changed their minds since, thank goodness. So it was really a struggle also to get uh, a time map made open source. I had to sort of have meetings with the people from the business to liaison office, which has had about 15 names since, um, to convince them that we, they weren't going to make lots of money out of the time map. You know, it, it was just not going to happen unless they wanted to invest a few million, but they didn't want to do that, so they're not going to make any money. So eventually they said okay, and that was fine. That meant that when I came to make Heurist open source, which was in 2013, it had been on the sort of the, the pipeline for quite a while, um, no problem. The, the University Council, uh, you know, was very helpful, went and looked at the different open source uh, licenses on Google Code, on GitHub, on um, etc., and decided on Google Code. And I said, fine. 
Uh, unfortunately, it turns out the Google code is closing down next year, so we're going to have to we'll switch over to GitHub, but it's not going to be a big deal, because we use Git. We use Git already anyway. Um, so attitudes really have changed. There's a challenge, however, with developing generic systems, and that is that the initial costs are much higher than developing a bespoke system. I mean, by a bespoke system, I mean you basically map the data, the database and data structures to the domain that you're trying to describe. And that means that you can really focus your uh, design on what you exactly want. The disadvantage of that, of course, is if you don't get it right at the beginning, you can be in a lot of trouble later but when you have to change things around. And it won't necessarily be portable to other situations, or if it is, it has to be modified, then all the software has to be modified. So there's, there's, there's knock-on effects. Um, with a gener generic system, you think in terms of broad general patterns. What sort of things do I want? Well, basically, I can tell you, you want entities, you want to be able to connect entities to other entities and describe the type of connection in some sort of detail. Um, you want to be able to have fields, you want repeating fields, you want um, required fields or with a limited number of uh, repetitions, you want uh, drop downs pulled in from a tree of terms, etc. Et so you basically look at those general principles of the sort of things that you want to be able to do, of being able to include um, multimedia files, of being able to include geographic information and so forth. And then you implement that rather than implementing any specific case. And then you can overlay that with an interface which will give you the specific cases. Um, they're more difficult to describe. They're more difficult to sell to funders to say, we're going to do a generic thing that will solve everybody's problems. And they go, yeah, but which problem are you going to solve? Well, actually, we're going to solve all of them. Well, no, not really, but we're going to try. Um, so, you have to look at different models of, of maintaining that funding, and I've sort of put here four central, i.e. somebody gives you a stack of money and says, do it. That's the best thing that happens, really. There's institutional funding where the institution decides it's worth doing. In a sense, that's kind of the way that I built Heurist, although the institution didn't know it was funding Heurist. Uh, it just knew it was funding my lab, and Heurist was being produced. And Every year, at the end of the year, the, the budget was, was blown and they went, that's very bad. And then I'd just do it again the next year. And I went on doing that for a number of years. Um, and the result was we were able to produce a piece of generic software. Uh, a tithe where you basically help, well, you, you give people the software, um, you maybe give them, give them help with getting started and using it, and you say, well, okay, we need a sort of a contribution support to it. And a consulting where you're doing the same thing, but you're saying, well, your project's a big project, we're gonna to need to spend all of ours, so that will cost you X, and that will cost you Y. Uh, I mean, those are the sorts of models which are used in the open source world in general, so um, that's pretty generic. <clears throat> and one of the problems is good software fades into the background, and then nobody knows they're using it. You know, how many people write uh, this, this article was written with Microsoft Word. Sorry to mention Microsoft Word again. Of course you don't. I mean, it's just like, it's there. You use it. Or, or Office, whatever. So, um, this is the interface of the new version of Heurist. It's not quite finished, so it'll change very slightly. But broadly speaking, this is the way it is. Um, but the point is that people think this is Heurist. And in some sense, they're right. Now, Michael Chano was uh, saying yesterday, it isn't, people think the interface of Access or FileMaker Pro or Heurist is the database, and it's not. It's what's behind it that's, that's the database. And I think it's very important that it doesn't really matter what's behind it. You know, if it's a decent, solid, open, uncomprehensible, uh, documented, stable uh, platform that holds the data in generic uh, fashion, it doesn't matter what it is, really. Uh, obviously, performance issues will be relevant and so forth. Longevity, support, all of those things will be relevant. I think once you've decided on using something, you have to stick with it, at least for a block of time. So we started in MySQL. We're still using MySQL. I might, I might switch to MariaDB. I happen to have a friend who's a uh, MySQL MariaDB consultant who can help me with that. 
Um, or I might switch to Postgres, who knows? Or I might not. I mean, for the moment, I think I'll just stick with, you know, I haven't got the time and the resources to think about it, so I'll just stick with what I've got, because it works. And it satisfies most of the requirements there. Um, so I've got two lots of, 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 um, of software, basically. One lot which is administrative, which manages the structure of the database that you're recording, and the other lot which provides the end user interface, which allows queries, which produces visualization so on, which is what we just saw, in fact. So it's really these, these pieces of software which people think are Heurist, because that's what, how they interact with Heurist, and they're part of Heurist, are not necessary to the database. You could throw them away and write the software in anything else. You could use SQL queries. You could use um, access to accesses and do whatever. I mean, what's important is the core database that it's a clearly well-defined structure. So the interesting thing about Heurist, and I've been talking to a few people in the last day or so, um, is there are only six. I have not actually looked at the database structure to check that I've got this right. I've just sort of done it in my head. But I think there are only six tables that matter in the sense that they contain data. There's a records table which contains all the records, uh, i.e. entities. There's a details table which contains all effectively fields for, the, for all the records, which is tied obviously by a foreign key to the <coughs> records table. There's a record type table, a detail type or field type, well, the detail type table. There's a field structure table which defines what fields are required for each entity. And there's something, oh, a term, a terms definition table. So those are the six tables that matter, they're the data. All the rest is about users, ownership permissions, caching to improve performance. Um, oh, there's, a, there's one more, I forgot. There's a file store table which basically references all the files that have been uploaded or imported into the, into the system. So <clears throat> I think What's really important if you're going to build open source software is that you think beyond just doing what you need to do. And you think, what's going to happen when this data system, I won't call it a database, when this data system, which includes not just the textual data of the database, but also files, videos, 3D models, et cetera, et cetera, how will it be archived? How will it be accessible into the future? So I think it's very important to think about the sustainability of the different file formats particularly and how well they are documented and their connections are documented um, uh, in, in, in um, designing a system. Uh, it's not good enough just to do it and think about it in the present. You have to think about the future. So going back to the interface of Heurist, this is actually the older interface of Heurist. You'll see it's a bit cluttered compared with the new one which is <coughs> basically a much cleaner design. It's also, it's, it's structurally cleaner, uh, the way it works. So it's basically similar, comprehensible, but it's more, it's a refinement. And in fact, this interface is only one way that Heurist 4 can look. With Heurist 3, it always looked the way, it always looked like that, pretty much. Heurist 4 can look like this, but it can look, all of those are, are widgets which can be moved around or not used. So you can, in fact, build public, search interfaces which only have a search field on them and the results or whatever. Um, and the basic structure is navigation on the left where we have basically saved searches. Uh, in the middle we have the results of a search which could be either a search up in the top or a saved search. And on the right we have various sorts of visualizations which are coordinated visualizations so if you select something in the map it would be uh, highlighted in the, um, the search results and vice versa. Um, the map is filtered by the timeline. We've added quite a lot of new functionality to the map to allow it basically a, a, a sort of a, a, a layered mapping uh, system. We're not trying to write a GIS because there are plenty of good GISs like QGIS, etc. So we view that as being the role. We see it more as an export from Heurist. We're not really trying to do that tight integration. We might later on, but you know, time will tell. Um, so we have entity record types. This is the basic when you create a new Heurist database, which is just a click of a button, give it a name, the database is created. 
you get a set of record type, of entity types which everybody practically uses in every database, in my experience. Um, so that's automatic. You can then go and import uh, additional entity types from any other Heuris database that's been registered with the Heuris system. Um, and we have a few predefined databases. So for instance, a bibliographic database. So when you go to the bibliographic database and import the bibliographic types, you get all of these entity types, all the fields that go with them, all the terms that go with them, all the relationships that would go with them. So you, you don't have to build your database from scratch. You can pull in structure from elsewhere. And we are working with a project called Fames, which we'll talk about in a moment. How am I going for time? Ten minutes? Huh? I'll slow down. Um, uh, uh, we, we're working with a project called Fames, which is in fact building, um, uh, I guess, schemas for archaeological excavations and surveys, particularly surveys at the moment they're working on. So, um, this, this is how we describe the fields in the, in, the, in the database. And I've highlighted in red record pointers and relationship markers because the other fields are the, the standard sorts of fields with repeatability and, and, and so forth, lists of terms and so forth. So here, for instance, is a database with the relationships between the different entities. The size of the circle, gray circle, is the number of entities in the database. Um, the thickness of the line shows the number of connections and the arrow shows the direction of the connections. So this is the basic schema of the whole database, this database summary that you can get from the front page of Heurist. And if you click on any of those, it will show you what the connection fields are and how many of them there are and so forth. Um, <coughs> so, going uh, so the, the sort of design patterns, I've mentioned them re uh, previously, that we're using are things like repeating or multi-value multi fields, um, which can be limited to a specific number of repeats, uh, or, or a minimum number, which gives you required or, not, or, or, or optional. And of course, you can create those by programming within any database, but the idea is this is something that is built in, because it's something that everybody requires. I mean, it's very rare, I would say, it's extremely rare to have databases where you don't have some form of repeating fields. Um, uh, the second thing that we want to do is we want to be able to reference one entity from another entity. Um, for instance, you might have, well, what might have the, 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 the context to which a find belongs. The find needs to be able to, to reference the context to which it belongs. Um, you could, of course, have the context reference all the finds, but it's uh, more elegant to do it the other way around. Um, uh, so basically, the, find, the finds are child records of the context. Um, in a simple case, uh, things just belong to, to the parent. So you just need a pointer, effectively a foreign, a foreign key, which may be repeating. Um, uh, and uh, all the semantics of that connection are held in the field name. The fact that the field name is called, you know, parent context, or is called uh, ship's captain, or whatever, whatever the, the field is called. Um, they can be, in Heuris, they can be constrained to a target entity type, so they can be, uh, or more than one, in fact, so you can say which entity types are valid in this context. Um, they're a foreign key, effectively. And um, uh, um, you can combine that with the pattern of multiple values as well. And the system takes care of consistency with all of, with all of that. <coughs> um, the, uh, the third pattern is to reference it with another entity um, through an intermediate relationship record. Now, uh, relationship records came about because uh, one day I wanted to do relationships between two entity types and I thought, well, hang on a second. I have a database system where I can design new entity types. Uh, I have a database system where I can put pointers between one entity type and another. Why don't I just create an entity type with pointers in two directions and I've got a relationship type and I can add additional fields for relationship type using a, a drop-down term list for start and end date, for notes, for 
interpretation and justification and bibliographic references and so on. So I did, I did that. And in fact, my staff all said, that's rubbish, you can't do everything with Huris. And I was like, well, why not? And um, so they were very sort of anti for a, for, for a while. And then about two or three months later, somebody said, you could do that with relationships. And after that, everything was done with relationships. So it didn't take very long to, uh, to catch on. Um, so basically, the relationships are a similar function to pointer field, but the semantics of the relationship are largely held within the relationship record. And it's extensive. You can add additional fields to a relationship record, but by default it has those ones I mentioned, including the time range, because a lot of relationships are not permanent. Um, uh, we won't go there, really. Um, so, uh, good. Good, that's, that, that's fine. Um, uh, yes. So here, for instance, is, is another thing we have is a relationship marker field. So the idea of the relationship marker field is it actually does not contain any data, but it says in the data entry form, I want to put a relationship of this type at this point. And it constrains what the relationship is. So if you were, say, describing uh, a find, you could put at the top a relationship marker that points it to a context uh, and, um, and, and that would and basically say it must be a context that it, it indicates and the only types of uh, relationship are, and you can make a list of the types of relationships that you want to use uh, to make that connection. Um, if it's something like a bibliographic record, you would be saying, well, author, it's repeatable because you can have multiple authors, you need to maintain the, author, the order of the authors, otherwise the, the first, first sort of author is going to become offended um, uh, and it's going to make it very hard to find it in the library as well. Um, so uh, basically the, the relationship marker record acts as a, as a, as a a placeholder in effect and a constrainer of the relationships that can be done that pla <coughs> places them in the data entry form so you're not just having to create relationships between things they are seen in context um, so I've gone here into the actual detail of the field you can see here I've got a vocabulary called personal relationships which contains a number of different fields like, uh, sorry, the terms that I can look at I can add terms to that, I can add new vocabularies and choose them, and edit terms takes me to the complete tree of terms where I can um, move things around and, and create and, and delete. Um, once I've done all this, I end up with a, a classic, basically, graph database of connected entities. So this is a particular query with the entities that are connected to it and the, the resulting um, uh, network graph. Um, uh, I don't know whether I have time to go through in detail the spreadsheet spaghetti soup. But I, I don't want to offend any of the Italians in the room, but uh, uh, um, uh, that's what I like to think of it as. Uh, and these are some of the things that go wrong with spreadsheets. Um, and uh, you know, I end up having to unmangle uh, a lot of databases databases which have been created with spreadsheets um, and uh, this is a, sort of an actual illustration of one this is about uh, execution balance something I didn't know that existed until I worked on this uh, where basically each line of the spreadsheet is a pamphlet that contains one or more execution balance about one or more people being executed per ballot um, by various means, they only tend to get executed once, although it may use several methods, um, at a date, at a place, they, oh, I, can, I can go on. Um, so I have to basically pull this apart. So we had to in fact develop a generic uh, CSV importer, uh, which basically pulls in the CSV file, gives you all the fields, gives you example data that you can step through, and then allows you to match multiple records to, um, uh, to the, uh, uh, sorry, match multiple fields 
um, with the database. So the idea here is that you can pull data in without duplicating data which exists. That the process basically involves going through it repeatedly and creating a series of IDs for different, um, for different entities that are in those columns. And when you've got all the IDs, you can import those as pointer fields uh, into the data along with all the other data. Um, it's a bit involved, but it was the best we could do to make a rather complicated process of uh, decomposition easy. If there's only a few fields and it's well structured and there aren't lots of entities mixed in it, it's pretty easy to do. So it's, you know, the complexity is proportional to the, to the, um, the difficulty of the data. I've mentioned FAMES. I'll very quickly say FAMES is a wonderful tablet-based system with automatic synchronization of tablets uh, to a central database, which looks a lot like Heurist, uh, although independent, completely independently developed and it's running in SQLite. And we have a means in Heurist to take a Heurist database, create the structure of the FAMES database, uh, and then that gets spread out to the tablets. The tablets are used to collect data. It's all synchronized back to the central database across all the tablets that can be done continuously on a daily basis or whatever you want. And then it can be sucked back into a Heurist and used, a Heurist can be used for analysis and presentation of, of the information. And I think I'll just skip through that and say um, that's, that's our website. You can watch me for five minutes tell you all about Heurist. And that's the contact information. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.